Brazilian health workers have urged the International Criminal Court to investigate President Jair Bolsonaro's government over its mishandling of the coronavirus pandemic. The Caribbean community began a virtual security conference this Monday to analyse issues in the region in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. India's Prime Minister officially opened three new COVID-19 testing facilities in New Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata this Monday. From the headquarters of Teleso English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the South and I'm Katrina Goss. Brazilian health workers this Monday urged the International Criminal Court to investigate President Jair Bolsonaro's government for crimes against humanity over its handling of the coronavirus pandemic. The case was presented in The Hague by a coalition of unions, which represent more than one million healthcare workers across Brazil. In a statement, the unions accused Bolsonaro's far-right administration of being criminally negligent in its management of the COVID-19 pandemic, thus risking the lives of healthcare professionals and the Brazilian population. Secretary for the Americas region of the UNI Global Union Federation, Marcio Monsani, stated that the Bolsonaro administration must be held accountable for its response to the pandemic. More than 87,000 COVID-19 deaths have now been reported in Brazil. According to the Brazilian Health Ministry, over 600 new fatalities were confirmed in the past 24 hours. Over 24,000 new cases have also been reported since Sunday, which means that Brazil has now confirmed more than 2.4 million COVID-19 cases. The most affected state is Sao Paulo, with over 21,000 COVID-19 deaths, followed by Rio de Janeiro, with nearly 13,000. The Cuban Health Ministry presented an update on COVID-19 figures in the country this Monday. As a result of the analysis of these 3,212 samples, 37 people in our country tested positive for COVID-19, positive for SARS-CoV-2. A total of 250,415 COVID-19 tests have been done in Cuba out of which 2,532 have tested positive, representing 1.01%. And the National Director of Epidemiology at the Cuban Public Health Ministry also highlighted the number of recovered patients. Today, we gave two discharges here in Havana. Compared to the number of admissions, it is not a positive balance. 93% of COVID-19 patients in our country have recovered from the disease. We are talking about 2,351 people. Meanwhile, in Trinidad and Tobago, one additional person tested positive for COVID-19 overnight, bringing the total number of confirmed cases to 148. According to official figures, the country tally has conducted over 6,000 COVID-19 tests, while the number of fatalities remains at 8. Presumption that the school plant has the facility to isolate, that there is the presumption that someone from the Ministry of Health would arrive on the compound in a timely manner. Well, at this point in time, tutor stands to be guided by the Ministry of Health's pronouncements. Good? And this is why we are saying that there must be proper consultation. Continue to advise our members to take care of themselves and use the precautions. And if necessary, we will then have a discussion with our members on what course of action we will follow. Prime Minister of Barbados, Mia Motley, accepted a donation of essential medical supplies for the Caribbean community from the World Health Organization and the Jack Ma Foundation. Motley stated that the surgical and N95 masks would greatly assist Caribbean governments in protecting their frontline workers. What is important is that we not only have access, which we didn't as a small region as CARICOM on our own, but that we are also looking to be able to procure at prices that are usually only available for much larger countries and populations. And therefore, a St. Kitts with 40,000 people will have the same access as a Nigeria with 200 million people. And that is the fundamental 
policy space that we've negotiated to make a difference to the people of the region. Also in Barbados, former Prime Minister Owen Seymour Arthur passed away this Monday at the age of 70. Seymour Arthur, who served as Barbados' fifth Prime Minister, was hospitalised in mid-July with heart complications. The former Prime Minister led the country for an unprecedented three consecutive terms from 1994 to 2008, having served as a Member of Parliament from 1984 to 2013. According to Barbadian authorities, a period of national mourning will be observed for three days, with the national flag flown at half-mast. In Bolivia, social organisations have strongly condemned the electoral court for once again pushing back the date of the general elections, this time until October 18th. In response, they announced that nationwide protests will begin this week. The Supreme Electoral Court's decision to delay elections for the third time has been widely criticised by most sectors of society. We are giving the Supreme Electoral Court 72 hours to retract their decision, which stands opposed to electoral law and the Constitution. And we warn that if the court fails to comply, the Bolivian people will begin indefinite mobilizations. Bolivia's main workers' union has already called for mobilizations in the cities of La Paz and El Alto. There will be a great march next week on Tuesday. We call on all social organizations to join us to reject these latest attacks against our democracy. We must reject the suspension of September 60th elections. Social leaders also highlighted that the September 6th elections were established under the law and electoral authorities are acting outside it. We want laws to be respected. Rules must be followed. One resolution cannot supersede another, especially a resolution that was promoted by the de facto authorities, which has already attacked the Legislative Assembly. Tuesday's mobilization will end with a popular meeting where citizens can propose the necessary measures to demand respect for the law. During this meeting, we will call for an indefinite mobilization because the people are tired. We are very upset. We cannot allow more delays and cannot allow for elections to be pushed back indefinitely. We will debate the possibility of blocking roads across Bolivia. We are living a very difficult situation in matters of education, of health. Everything is being privatized. Hospitals lack supplies. And now even our democracy is being undone. This third delay of the elections happened under pressure from far-right sectors, which were also behind last November's coup against the democratically elected government of President Evo Morales. It also responds to the right wing's continued lack of popular support, as all of their candidates fall far behind the candidate for the left-wing mass EPSP party, Luis Arce. And we'll be right back after this short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. The Caribbean community this Monday began a virtual security conference to analyse issues in the region in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. The conference, the first of its kind to be held by CARICOM member states, will analyse the challenges, impact, implications and experiences of the COVID-19 pandemic on regional security. The four-day conference is hosted by the CARICOM Implementation Agency for Crime and Security under the title Securing Our Community Within the Era of COVID-19 and Beyond. The objective is to identify best practices that can be applied to similar situations in the future. The virtual meeting will bring together experts in the field, government officials, academics and representatives of the private sector and civil society. The agenda includes debates on peace, security and development, criminality and organised crime, cyber security, borders, gender violence, climate change and resilience and maritime security. Chinese authorities on Monday morning entered the U.S. consulate in Chengdu after ordering the mission to close late last week in response to a U.S. order to force the closure of Beijing's consulate in Houston. This morning, the U.S. personnel left the compound as required by China and the U.S. consulate general in Chengdu was closed. Chinese authorities then entered through the front entrance and took it over. 
demanding the closure of the U.S. consulate in Chengdu and taking over the premises is China's legitimate and necessary response to the unjustified U.S. act of closing Chinese consulate in Houston and breaking into the compound. What China has done confirms to international law the basic rule of international relations and diplomatic practices. The current situation of China-U.S. relations is not what China wants to see, and U.S. is responsible for all this. We once again urge the U.S. to correct its wrong decisions immediately and create necessary conditions to bring the bilateral relationship back on track. The Director General of the World Health Organization has noted that nearly 16 million coronavirus cases have now been reported to the UN Health Agency, as well as more than 600,000 deaths worldwide. On Thursday, the WHO Director will convene the organization's emergency committee as part of a procedural requirement six months after the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern. The Director General stressed that strong political leadership, education to raise awareness of the risks, increased testing, hygiene and physical distancing measures have proven effective in several countries that have carefully followed guidelines to fight the virus. But although our world has changed, COVID-19 has changed our world. It has brought people, communities, and nations together and driven them apart. It has shown what humans are capable of, both positively and negatively. We have learned an enormous amount, and we are still learning. But although our world has changed, the fundamental pillars of the response have not. As we mark six months since the declaration of the global health emergency, the COVID-19 pandemic is illustrating that health is not a reward for development. It's the foundation of social, economic, and political stability. We are not prisoners of the pandemic. Every single one of us can make a difference. The future is in our hands. Executive Director of Emergencies and Dr. Mar Belgian Prime Minister Sophie Wilms has announced renewed restrictions on the number of people it is considered safe to have contact with as the country faces a rising number of coronavirus cases. Until now, the social bubble for each individual was limited to 15 people per week. From Wednesday, it will be reduced to five people, always the same for the next four weeks for an entire household. So we are counting for the household and no longer per person. Children under the age of 12 do not count in those five people. And this Monday, Belgian health authorities warn that the country is seeing a worrying and rapid rise in coronavirus cases, with almost half of the new infections recorded around the port city of Antwerp. Special local measures have been adopted to try to contain the spread of the virus. Since the start of the pandemic, Belgium has confirmed over 66,000 COVID-19 cases and a death toll of almost 10,000. The country is the ninth hardest hit by the COVID-19 pandemic in Europe. The President of the Philippines has called for the restoration of the death penalty for drug offences as part of his controversial anti-narcotics crackdown in the midst of a surge in coronavirus cases. The swift passage of a law reviving the death penalty by lethal injection for crimes specified under the Comprehensive Dangerous Act of 2002. I did not hear so much clapping, so I presume that they are not interested. This law will not only help us deter criminality, but also save our children from the dangers posed by the illegal and dangerous drugs. And the Philippines has now reported over 82,000 COVID-19 cases and a death toll stands at almost 2,000. The country is now 12th among those most affected by the pandemic in Asia. Julian Assange's lawyer, Baltasar Garzón, arrived on Monday at the Spanish National Court in Madrid to testify in the espionage case against his client.
The case surrounds the alleged espionage activities against Assange while he was residing in the Ecuadorian embassy in London between 2015 and 2018 by the Spanish security company UC Global. The defence states that Assange was spied on in multiple ways, including taking his fingerprints from a glass and stealing a dirty nappy to conduct DNA tests after he was visited by his children. Fidel Narvaez, former consul of Ecuador in London, and Assange's partner Stella Morris have also been summoned as witnesses. At least 100 migrants arrived on the Italian island of Lampedusa on Monday, which continues to see an influx of migrant arrivals. Italian Coast Guard officials said they had picked up 44 people during an operation in the Mediterranean Sea. Another 70 migrants, believed to be Tunisian nationals, also travelled to the island in their own vessels, according to officials. A facility which usually houses up to 95 people has held up to 1,000 migrants over the past week. A firefighter was killed and four injured in a traffic accident while fighting a forest fire in central Portugal that could continue to rage through Wednesday. According to Civil Protection Authorities, firefighter Diogo Dias was killed this weekend in a traffic accident in the context of fighting a fire that broke out in Oleiros, central Portugal. Meanwhile, on Sunday, more than 700 firefighters and 14 water bomber planes fought the fire that broke out on Saturday evening before spreading to the Castelo Branco region, 200 kilometres north of the capital, Lisbon. And we have more news coming up after a final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back to From the South. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi on Monday officially opened three new COVID-19 testing facilities in New Delhi, Mumbai and Kolkata. According to his office, each testing facility is capable of analysing as many as 10,000 tests a day. Speaking via video conference, Modi claimed India had taken the right decisions at the right time during the pandemic and was in a controlled situation compared to other countries. India's chief medical research agency says the country tested over 500,000 samples for COVID-19 on Sunday. The almost 50,000 new cases reported on Monday brought India's nationwide tally to beyond, beyond 1.4 million, representing the world's third highest after the United States and Brazil. Millions of citizens of the country have been fighting with the coronavirus pandemic bravely. Today we are launching a high-tech testing facility. The efforts of West Bengal, Maratatra and Uttar Pradesh will be further threatened in their fight against the corona pandemic. Friends, the way right decision we're taking at the right time has resulted in our country being in a far controlled situation compared to other countries. The rate of deaths are far lower in our country compared to many big countries. In January, we had just one center for corona testing and today 1,300 labs are working around the country. Today in India, we're conducting more than 500,000 tests a day and efforts are on to take the testing ability to 1 million a day in the next few weeks. उसी का परिणाम है कि भारत more than 80,000 cases of COVID-19 have now been reported across the African continent. According to information from the Africa Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the continent has reported a COVID-19 death toll of over 17,000. South Africa, Egypt, Nigeria, Ghana, Algeria and Morocco remain the worst hit nations. A new round of violence in Sudan's Darfur region has seen more than 60 people killed. The Sudanese Prime Minister has promised to deploy more troops in the conflict-stricken region. The UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs in Sudan said about 500 armed men attacked the village of Masteri, located 30 miles south of the capital of West Darfur province, on Saturday. The latest clashes between different tribes in the area started on Saturday and lasted until late Sunday. According to the UN office, about 2.8 million people in the Darfur region are estimated to be severely food insecure between June and September. The UN Refugee Agency says more than 300,000 Sudanese refugees... China's 16th peacekeeping engineering unit to Sudan's Darfur region held an oath-taking rally on Monday before their expedition to East Africa to fulfill a five-month mission. The detachment mainly comprises soldiers selected from an engineering brigade of the 82nd Group Army of the Central Theatre Command of the Chinese People's Liberation Army. The unit has drawn up a disease prevention and control plan based on the COVID-19 situation in the mission area. This is the first time the brigade will conduct a peacekeeping mission abroad. 
The former president of the Central African Republic, Francois Borsisi, announced last week that he's running in the December presidential elections. The country has been ravaged by civil war since his ouster in 2013. Activists of Borsisi's Kwan Na Kwa party have been meeting in the capital, Bangui, since Friday, and the announcement was widely expected. The veteran politician took power following a 2003 coup before being overthrown himself 10 years later by Michel de Jotodia, head of the mainly Muslim Seleka rebel coalition in the predominantly Christian country. Since then, the landlocked nation has spiraled further into violence. In Lebanon, 168 new COVID-19 cases and four more deaths were recorded over the past 24 hours. According to the health ministry, the new cases take the country's overall tally since February 21st to more than 3,000, while the death toll now stands at 51. Meanwhile, 137 patients were hospitalized for coronavirus over the past 24 hours, including 34 who were admitted into intensive care units. In Iraq, two demonstrators died and several dozen were injured during clashes with security forces in Baghdad. Thousands of Iraqis demonstrated in Tahrir Square in downtown Baghdad and other cities across the country to protest against ongoing power outages and corruption. Ali al-Bayati, member of Iraq's High Commission for Human Rights, said that security forces violently attacked protesters who are demanding better power conditions. This weekend, the world celebrated the 232nd anniversary of Mozart's Symphony No. 40 in G minor, composed in 1788. To mark the date, we finish this news brief with a salsa version of the masterpiece. Remember, you can find these and many other stories on our website and on social media. For Telly English, I'm Katrina Goss. Thank you for watching and enjoy the music.